Our story begins as the great ice sheets were advancing over the northern hemisphere, turning the world colder and drier. This was the Ice Age. And it belonged to the wolf. This vast landscape was their backyard. There were millions of wolves roaming the continents of the Northern Hemisphere. And whether they lived in the Arctic or the desert, they lived in packs. Our ancestors would have feared and admired the wolf's speed, stamina, and superior senses. The wolf pack was the perfect killing machine. Once they sniffed out prey, it was already too late. Together, they were able to take down animals far larger than themselves. Wolf packs have a strict social order, led by an alpha male and alpha female. And the alphas got the choice bits, but the pack got its share too. And only the alpha female had pups. But just as it took the pack to bring down prey, the pack helped raise the young. A wolf pack was a family. And in that sense, they were just like us. Clan loyalty held us together too and kept us alive against tremendous Ice Age odds. Because for thousands of years, we trespassed in a world that was not ours. Back then, there were less than one million people on the entire planet. And if our ancestors felt like they were always being watched, it's because they were. Wolves, like us, are curious animals. For a carnivore with a nose a hundred times more sensitive than ours, the smell of cooking meat would have been an irresistible lure. They followed their noses to the edge of our camps and discovered an unexpected prize, our garbage. Even for this top predator, hunting was hard work that often went unrewarded. The most curious, least aggressive wolves discovered that there were rewards to be had living close to us. Our scraps became a new kind of fast food, and the camp wolf was born.
Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, Dr. Robert Wayne, is the senior author of a new genetic analysis of wolves and dogs. I think it was initially a loose association. Wolves started following humans because they provided a resource and then kind of adopted the human niche. And those wolves, by just by the nature of that new habit, that is, they were no longer territorial, they were not hunting territorial prey, they were following humans, there was some kind of reproductive divergence. In time, the camp wolves living close to humans became genetically isolated from the wolves of the forests and wilderness. Eventually, in locations across the Middle East, Asia, and Europe, a new social order dawned. And the most curious humans and wolves were taking one small step toward the creation of the dog. This first timid contact began a dance between our two species that would change our world forever. There must have been something special about wolves which predisposed them towards domestication. And I think the real inkling of that is wolves were the only large carnivore that humans ever domesticated. Camp wolves became a familiar presence around our campsites. and we became more comfortable with them. These were perilous times for our ancestors. They were surrounded by animals bigger, stronger, and faster than us. When night fell, we huddled around our fires, wary of the danger from predators lurking in the darkness. It's likely the camp wolves' earliest service to humans was as an alarm to danger. In protecting her own young, this camp wolf unintentionally protected the humans.
But now her pups were orphaned. Clan mothers could never have known that the cries of the wolf pups would trigger their brain chemistry, urging them to nurse for these babies just as they did their own. This brain chemical, oxytocin, is made by all mammals, and it's released through suckling and by warmth and repetitive touch. That night around the campfire, no pup or clan member was immune to the powerful connective chemistry being unleashed. Today, we are just beginning to understand how such simple acts of kindness can ignite the social brain chemistry that makes us less fearful and willing to develop social ties. The pups and clan members first felt this bond more than 32,000 years ago. As new generations from these orphaned pups were born, the camp wolf evolved into the proto-dog, the precursor to man's best friend. And with each new litter, our ancestors kept the tamest pups and shunned the rest. Early on, any wolf that hinted at aggression, or a proto-dog that hinted at aggression towards humans, especially our children, would have been immediately uh, removed and killed. The ones that successfully integrate with humans are the ones that tend to be more docile. Instead of natural selection guiding evolution, Human intervention changed the very nature of the proto-dogs. Long before there was a word for it, our ancestors became geneticists. And they created the wolf that didn't bite. And set the stage for all of our dogs. A recent genetic study provides clues of how all dog breeds are related and how they're all related to wolves. We compared all our markers in the dog genome to the same markers in the wolf genome. And we asked, what markers are very divergent? And we find that the primary signal in the dog genome of origin is from Middle Eastern wolves. Genetic evidence points to Middle Eastern wolves as the original ancestors of our dogs. The genetic contributions from other wolf populations all occurred at later points in dog evolution. But when did the human-dog partnership begin? Our earliest archaeological evidence is a canine skull found not in the Middle East, but at Goye Cave in Belgium. When it was discovered in 1870, it was believed to be the skull of a wolf. But in 2007, Dr. Mita Jamonpre re-examined the skull and found something quite different. These skulls were discovered more or less 140 years ago, and they remained in the museum since then. They were excavated in two different caves in the Belgian Ardennes. This skull, as you can see, is very gracile, very slender compared to this wolf skull. It has quite a short snout, and this is typical for domestic dogs. Its teeth are still quite large, so this is uh, not typical for recent dogs, but uh, is, is a sign that it's really an old dog. This skull has been carbon dated as being over 31,000 years old twice as old as the oldest dog skull previously found. This is the most compelling evidence that long before the end of the Ice Age, environmental and human influences had given rise to the dog. And it may have looked something like this. But was it tame? Tameness means to me docility, that is. An animal that will not harm you generally and uh, 
will be submissive to your needs. Domestication, to me, means much more than that. That is, if you open the gates for your dog, it may go out for a walkabout, but it's still going to come back to you for food and shelter and even for companionship. It's part of human society and dependent upon it. The Goya skull at 31,000 years ago is indeed a very old dog, and it really does suggest that domestication um, occurred on the order of tens of thousands of years ago. Other evidence of humans and dogs has been found in Israel, Western Russia, and Germany. But perhaps the most intriguing find is in southern France. Chauvet Cave, discovered in 1994, contains the earliest cave paintings in Europe. Perhaps the most important discovery was not found on the cave walls, but in the damp clay floor. Here, archaeologists found footprints of a child that appears to have been accompanied by a dog. Unlike wolf tracks, these have the shorter middle toe of a dog's. Carbon dating of the child's torch marks swiped on the cave wall tell us he and this ancient dog may have taken their walk together 26,000 years ago. The archaeological record is tantalizing, but sparse. And genetic research can tell us where dogs came from, but not how closely they may have looked like the dogs in our living rooms today. In this analysis, we're looking at lineages, in a sense. We're tracing backwards in the family tree. We're not necessarily saying how that dog looked 1,000 or 2,000 years ago. We're asking what its ancestry was. So the dog that we see today and recognize as a Samoyed or a Chow Chow, um, its ancestors might have looked far different than that. Our relationship may go back over 30,000 years, but what our dogs look like today is a fairly recent creation. Something on the order of 80% of our dogs probably derive from selective breeding practices in the last few hundred years with the Victorian era. 11, 12,000 years ago, there wasn't anywhere near the um, strict breeding regime that exists today. So an individual may have had a whole mixture of dogs um, small to large with various abilities and tried to select amongst them but there was nowhere near the rigid types that we see today. The last cold snap of the Ice Age turned Western Europe both cooler and drier. As climate changed, our ancestors had to adapt. And for hunter-gatherers, hunger was an everyday occurrence. And primitive hunting could be very much hit and miss. Our ancestors discovered their dogs could flush and kill game more efficiently than they could. Dogs had the keen ears and noses to find game, big and small, and the speed and agility to run it down. Wolves were specialists in cooperative hunting. Our ancestors learned that some dogs retained the wolf's instinct to hunt and to share their food with us, their pack. We began the process of selective breeding by mating only pairs of good hunting dogs. 
Our ancestors were literally creating the perfect partners for the hunt. This is the modern-day Saluki. It's a living relic of one of man's earliest shaping of a good hunting dog into a great one. A Saluki-like dog skeleton was found in a burial mound in northwest Iraq that dates back to 5,500 years ago. 3,300 years ago, this fan was made for King Tutankhamun, showing the young king hunting ostriches with a dog, the spitting image of a Saluki. Salukis are sighthounds. Over millennia, Salukis were carefully bred and trained to spot and chase game across the hottest day. Deserts. They aren't the fastest dogs humans created, but at 53 kilometers per hour, they're fast enough. Their real talent is being able to hold that speed for up to 3.2 kilometers to exhaust their prey, something even a wolf will rarely do. A Saluki's long legs can cover nearly three and a half meters in a single stride. At two points in their gallop, all four paws are off the ground. This efficient gait contributes to their incredible endurance. Wolves can run around 48 kilometers per hour. At top speed, a wolf stride is 1.8 to 2.5 meters. Salukis do not track by scent. Odors dissipate in the dry desert winds. Instead, Salukis rely on their vision to spot prey in the open landscape. Sight is generally considered one of the weaker of a dog's senses, but the long-skulled sighthounds have binocular vision like we do and a very wide field of vision, 270 degrees. That's 110 degrees wider than ours. From these first sighthounds came Afghans, Bourjois, Irish wolfhounds, and the fastest of all, the greyhounds. Today, most of us no longer need dogs as hunting partners and simply enjoy these popular breeds as cherished family members. hunter-gatherer ancestors were always at the mercy of climatic and seasonal changes. We can only imagine our ancestors' surprise and delight when they first saw their dogs doing this, herding. Little did they know, they were witnessing the beginning of the end of life as they had always known it. With dogs like this, herds could be gathered and contained, not followed. Game could be kept, not stalked. Thanks to dogs, wild animals became livestock, and we humans were on our way to becoming herders and farmers.
Herding dogs remain ready to work whenever asked, and their enthusiasm and devotion still wins our admiration and our hearts. Even today, Jerry Williams needs a bit of wolf to help him get the job done. My name is Jerry. I'm a rancher in the San Jose Valley. I couldn't even imagine ranching without a dog. Jerry runs a thousand head of cattle on his 10 square kilometer ranch. It's an idyllic life, made possible by some very good dogs. The big thing about the Border Collie dog is that they are the smartest dog in the world. They know their job, and they do it damn well. Get in. Look around. Just look around. Just way out. Way out. We've always used Border Collies day in, day out. And if I didn't have these dogs, I would have to have one to two more employees to help run our family operation. It would probably take me two to three times as long to get the work done. Jerry's Border Collies have retained their wolf's herding savvy, but are focused on a completely different goal. When wolf packs hunt, they work together to separate their intended prey from the herd. When this wolf-like pack stalks the herd, it's not to divide and conquer, but to keep them moving together. This inhibition of the killer instinct may seem unwolf-like, but it isn't. A good herding dog has the right balance of boldness, excitability, and a desire to herd. The dogs love to do what they do. They'll work their heart out and, uh, and do anything for me. They're the most loyal animals I've ever been around in my life. I'll be honest with you there. They're just like our family our, and best friends. We have to work with our best friends every day. We humans change the size, shape, and heart of our dogs. But the one wolf feature that came through evolution unscathed was the wolf's incredible sense of smell. Wolves, in favorable conditions, can detect a scent up to 2.8 kilometers away. And from the earliest days of our relationship with dogs, we've put their noses to work for us. We rely on keen vision to navigate our world, which is fine in open, well-lit places. But the dog's nose can smell what can't be seen. Animal behaviorist Alexandra Horowitz says to know the dog, you must know its nose and the ways it experiences the world. As we see the world, dogs smell the world. You know, we open up our eyes and there's the world visually in front of us. Dogs, you know, come into consciousness and take a big sniff, essentially. So we can kind of imagine that the entire geography of this world is redrawn for them in odors. And every sniff tells a vivid story. You watch a dog's nose for any length of time, they're doing terrific gymnastics. The sniff of a dog is not like our clumsy sniff. It looks like the dog is turning his head to see, but really he's turning his head to sniff first. Whether it's big, round, and the palest pink, or small, pointy, and glossy black, all dogs have highly sensitive noses. Humans are likely to discern one scent at a time, whichever is strongest. However, a dog can sort through a myriad of scents simultaneously. Okay. 
So if we smell a stew cooking, dogs smell each ingredient of the stew and the cook. Does it smell like that? Does this smell good to you, huh? Good dog. It's going to be really good. Dogs can move one nostril at a time, permitting them to perceive the direction of a scent. Once they pick up the scent, it dissolves on their wet nose. These liquefied molecules are then pushed further back into the snout. The dog devotes 40 times more of its brain power to smell than we do. A dog's nose contains about 387 square centimeters of scent receptors, called the epithelium. That's about the size of a 24 by 28 centimeter piece of paper. If you compared our scent receptor area, you would find it is a little smaller than a postage stamp. Amazingly, we've managed to take the great wolf nose and make it better. Yeah, they're, uh, they're on the move out there. Scent discrimination is part of obedience trials. Send your dog. Using its incredible sense of smell, the dog's task is to locate the one object on the field that its owner has handled. Through careful breeding, we created the Bloodhound Nose, complete with 300 million olfactory sensors. Even the Dachshund has 125 million. And the Beagle packs in 225 million scent receptors in its nose. We have 96 different breeds of scent hounds, dogs specifically created by us over the years for their exceptional sense of smell. And today, people use a dog's keen sense of smell in many ways. If an object has an odor, a dog can be trained to identify it and find it. And Dr. Giovanni Morsiani's dogs do just that. I like to present you the king of the table, the truffle. You can see how magnificent they are, that bowl of uh, uh, white and uh, uh, black truffle that the Lagotto Romagnolo find here in Bagnara di Romagna. It turns out that a dog's keen sense of smell is perfectly suited for sniffing out these subterranean delicacies. And the dog of choice for Italian truffle hunters is the Lagotto Romagnolo. They nearly died out as a breed, but in the 1970s, Dr. Morsiani was one of four Italian dog lovers that brought the dogs back from the edge of extinction. Truffle hunting dogs have been used for centuries to sniff out and find truffles in Italy and France. Every year, truffle hunters in Italy take to the woods, hoping that the sensitive noses of their trained dogs will lead them to buried treasure. Finding truffles is a game for the dogs, and they're given a treat each time they find one. The handler stops his dog before its nails ruin the truffles. Truffle hunting dogs are so prized that competing human truffle hunters sometimes dognap them. Anything to get an edge.
When it comes to plucking this musty jewel, nothing beats the power of the nose. Next to smell, the sense of hearing is the most acute of a wolf's senses. Wolves can hear as far away as six and a half kilometers in the forest and 16 kilometers in the open. Our modern dogs inherited their great sense of hearing from the wolf. As newborns, a puppy's ear flaps are not movable and their ear canals are sealed. They are deaf. Their ears don't begin to open until they're about two weeks old. By the end of the first month, the puppy's hearing is acute. They are able to detect the direction that a sound comes from, and just like us, they learn to screen out a lot of background noise. These are important skills because, as adults, these dogs will sleep through blaring stereos or honking cars. But open a bag of dog food, and they're wide awake. Dog ears come in an amazing variety. Extremely long and floppy, small, soft, and pert, or folding elegantly alongside the face. It's the pinna that's the outer, visible part of a dog's ear. Dogs are able to tilt, turn, raise, and lower their ears to locate not only the sound, but pinpoint the exact origin and accurately interpret whether it is threatening or not. The frequencies that dogs hear are nearly twice what we do, and they can pick up and distinguish sounds roughly four times the distance we can. At the outer edge of the ear is the ear flap. The flap funnels the sound through the ear canal to the tympanic membrane, or eardrum. Inside the eardrum are three small bones that increase the intensity of sound vibrations. The vibrations enter the spiral-shaped cochlea, which converts them into signals that are then delivered to the brain. And all this happens in six hundredths of a second. But what has proved to be the most important thing a dog can hear is the sound of the human voice. And the light. Beautiful. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Monkey, step. Dogs' ears are exquisitely tuned to the tone, pitch, and rhythm of our voices. These are non-verbal cues that reveal our emotions and intentions to our dogs. Up, switch. Nice, very nice. Ready? Let's go. Okay, Becky, pull. That ability to understand us allows companion dogs to enhance the independence and quality of life okay, of their stop. disabled partners. Becky, stop. And this partnership is built on the human voice. But just understanding our voice might not mean much without a dog's willingness to do things for us. Hearing dogs combine that willingness to help along with an acute sense of hearing the world around them. Tico, a Labrador retriever, is learning to recognize a knock at the door and alert his partner with a nudge to the leg. Service dogs not only assist with physical tasks, but also provide social support. During a two-week training session, participants and their dogs learn to work as a team. Pulling a wheelchair is a difficult skill to master. It's not easy to keep the dog and the wheelchair going straight. And this partnership is built around the human voice. But assistance dogs aren't just born, they're raised. Volunteers provide homes for the breeder dogs, whelp the puppies, and return them to the training facility at the age of eight weeks. From there, the puppies are placed with volunteer puppy raisers for socialization and obedience training. When they're between the ages of 15 and 18 months, the puppies return to the training center for six months of training before being partnered with a disabled person. Scientists believe that during the domestication process, 
dogs were selected for their unique ability to communicate with humans. But they understand far more of our language than we do of theirs. One essential talent that dogs have that seems to owe little to their wolf ancestry is their willingness to look us in the eye. One of the things that's unique about dogs is that they'll look you in the eyes. They'll gaze at you the way humans gaze at us. This is something a lot of other animals don't do. Wolves avert their eyes from directly gazing into ours, and they show little interest in what we look at or where we point. Even our closest relatives, the chimpanzees, show little interest in our point of view. But dogs soon discovered that looking deep into our eyes would give them the key to our thoughts, and maybe even our soul. It certainly provided a reliable way to communicate and bond with us. Those deep longing looks also release brain chemicals that deepen our bond to each other and make us throw that ball just one more time again and again. But beyond our dog's ability to understand us, we bring actual measurable joy to one another. I think the human-dog bond is um, particularly profound. There's a lot of research that shows that just by petting a dog, our cortisol stress hormone levels go down. Um, blood pressure levels go down. In many cases, dogs get the same effect. They also get a therapeutic effect from being petted by humans. It's these connections between us, looks, petting, and close physical contact, that release the hormone oxytocin in both of us. It's the same hormone that forms the powerful bond between mothers and their infants in all mammals. It turns out oxytocin has a powerful anti-stress effect on both of our species, making us calmer and more receptive to the nonverbal messages that pass between us. This hormone connection gave our dogs a welcome place at our ancestors' campfires and later in millions of our homes across the planet. We must give thanks to our ancient ancestors who looked into the eyes of a wolf and saw the promise of a friend. And to all those people that came before us that found they had a way with dogs. And helped to create the dogs we can no longer live without. Imagine the world if we had not befriended each other. It's nearly impossible as their footsteps have always shadowed ours. This is, however, a story without an end, an evolving tale of two species connected by thousands of yesterdays to innumerable tomorrows.